cross-regional basis by the governments of Nigeria, Thailand, Hungary, Australia, and Uruguay on the role of the Human Rights Council and the practical implementation of the responsibility to protect. For those of you who don't know me, I was in an earlier incarnation many years ago, Foreign Minister of Australia. I was also for 10 years President of the International Crisis Group, but I guess most relevantly for present purposes, I was the co-chair with my friend Mohamed Sanoon, who I think is joining us at this event, of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, which in 2001 introduced the concept of the responsibility to protect. My task is not to preempt detailed discussion, but rather to set the context for it and to introduce the distinguished speakers on the platform, which I'll do individually before they speak. But before we get to our speakers on the platform, we have the privilege of a statement from the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Nadi Delay, which we will now, if we may, listen to. put it, are the mass atrocity crimes, genocide, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, large-scale war crimes. Those catastrophic human rights violations where men, women and children are tortured, murdered, raped, starved, or forcibly expelled for no other reason than their race, ethnicity, religion, nationality, caste, class or ideology. I think it's important to remind ourselves on these occasions just how little international consensus there has been in the past about how to react to these cases. Even after the horrors of Auschwitz in the Second World War, to which the High Commission referred, even after all the developments in international human rights law and international humanitarian law, which came into effect after the Second World War, when it came to reacting to the genocide in Cambodia, the atrocities in East Pakistan, in Uganda, and then in the 1990s, those terrible cases we can all remember, particularly Rwanda, Bosnia, and Kosovo, the world was in almost total disarray. The only debate that took place in the 90s was around the concept of so-called humanitarian intervention, the so-called right to intervene, right to intervene militarily. Hardly anyone then talked about prevention. The options were send in the Marines or do nothing. The global north often rallied to that cry, as we can all remember. But countries in the global south were deeply and understandably <coughs> reluctant, after all their historical experience, to accept any notion generally expressed that the big guys had the right to throw their weight around in this way, whatever the circumstances. So we had that division, and we had that inaction in the face of terrible atrocity. It was a, to find a way through this consensus-free zone that the concept of responsibility to protect was born. It was initiated in the International Commission, a report published in 2001, and then endorsed, as has been said, at the UN General Assembly, sitting at head of state and government level and endorsed unanimously, it's worth remembering, at the 2005 World Summit. There are a number of crucial differences between responsibility to protect and the so-called right of humanitarian intervention, which is important to remind ourselves of. Responsibility to protect is primarily about prevention. Humanitarian intervention is only about reaction after the event. Responsibility to protect is about the whole continuum of reactive responses when prevention fails, from diplomatic persuasion, diplomatic pressure, to non-military measures like sanctions and international criminal court process. And only in extreme and exceptional last resort cases is it about military action. But humanitarian intervention is only about military action. It's one dimension. And responsibility to protect is about a much wider range of actors. Humanitarian intervention is only really about the role of those who are capable of applying coercive military force. In particular, responsibility to protect, as the High Commissioner reminded us, is primarily about the responsibility of sovereign states themselves to their own people, 
not to perpetrate atrocity crimes, not to allow atrocity crimes to occur on their territories. That obligation, that responsibility, remains absolute, unconditional, and continuing. And that's what so-called Pillar 1 of the Responsibility to Protect is all about. <coughs> Pillar 2 addresses the responsibility of others, other states, other international organizations, like the Human Rights Council, to assist states who want to be assisted in dealing with problems of ensuring the protection of their own people from mass atrocity crime. That's pillar two. Pillar three is about the responsibility of others if prevention fails, if a state is manifestly failing, as the language goes, to protect its own people, to then provide that protection. How? Well, in the High Commissioner's words, by every means prescribed and circumscribed by the UN Charter. Nothing in Pillar 3 allows or encourages anyone to operate outside the constraints of the UN Charter. Well, since 2005, there has, of course, been a long period of debate about the meaning, the scope, the limits of responsibility to protect. But what I think we can say is that it has won a remarkable degree of acceptance in principle, particularly as evident after the big debates in the General Assembly that have occurred in 2009, 2010, 2011. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon was not exaggerating when he said in September last year, our debates are now about how, not whether, to implement the responsibility to protect. No government questions the principle. Now, maybe he was talking about New York, and maybe Geneva is a slightly different town, and maybe we'll hear something to that effect a little later on. But he was not exaggerating when he spoke of the reality in New York. Of course, we do have to acknowledge that some of the debate about how to implement responsibility to protect is still very fierce, is still very divisive. It is true that from the high point that we reached in the Security Council in February and March last year, when there was real consensus about the steps that had to be taken to stop atrocity crimes that were happening in Libya and feared likely to happen on an even greater scale, from that we have, we have to acknowledge, we reached the low point of paralysis in the Council, even on adopting non-military measures in relation to what has proved to be an even worse human rights situation unfolding in Syria. We do have to recognize that there has been some infection of the whole responsibility to protect concept by the perception, accurate or otherwise, that the civilian protection mandate granted by the Security Council in Libya was in fact exceeded in some ways by the NATO-led intervention. We do need to debate as an international community, why that consensus fell away in the latter part of last year. We do need to debate the justification, or otherwise, of the perception I've described, and what we do about it. My own view, for what it's worth, is that our Brazilian colleagues have made a major contribution to that debate with their advocacy of the concept, the new concept, of responsibility while protecting. That's not throwing out the responsibility to protect baby with the bathwater, but rather recognizing that while keeping intact the full force of the responsibility to protect principle and norm, there does need to be, so the argument goes, a fundamental change in the way the Security Council goes about its business, in particular by allowing serious continuing debate on these controversial mandate issues that that's necessary if we're going to be able to get consensus again about these really hard cases. So that's all the debate that we need to have. But it's not a debate that we need to have today. It's not a debate we want to have today. It's a debate for New York in the General Assembly debate that's coming up soon on the whole question of Pillar 3 applications. It's, of course, a continuing debate for the Security Council. What we want to recognise here today is that if you're having a debate about Pillar 3, it's because prevention has failed. And the smartest possible thing the international community should be doing is focusing on these crucial preventive foundations in Pillars 1 and 2, and making these foundations, these preventive foundations, really work. In particular today, as the High Commissioner has said, 
We want to focus on the huge value-adding preventive role that the Human Rights Council can play in all the ways that Navi Pillay sketched out in a message, and in ways that a number of the speakers which follow will develop. In institution building, technical assistance, early warning, capacity building, best practice advice, fact-finding missions, and generally through relentless attention to the human rights warning signs, which if we heed and if we respond effectively to, will make those tough debates about cases like Libya and Syria simply irrelevant. So responsibility to protect has been a remarkable normative achievement. It has changed the way we think and act. And even if there is disagreement about just how to react in the really hard cases, I don't think anyone really thinks these days that these catastrophes are no one else's business in the way that was the case for so many centuries, for so many decades. I don't think anyone wants a return to the bad old days of indifference, the bad old days of inaction, the bad old days of impossible divisions in making decisions. But if we want to guarantee that, we do have to work much harder, much more effectively than we have so far to consolidate the preventive foundations of responsibility to protect, to really make it work in practice. And that, I repeat, is what today's discussion is all about. Well, the discussion will be led by a stellar cast, as you can see on the platform. And first up, I would invite to speak to you uh, Edward Luck from the United States, Special Advisor since 2008, and Assistant Secretary, as you, many of you will know, formerly Vice President of the International Peace Academy in New York, uh, very distinguished, long track record as an academic, and in particular served for a decade as President and Chief Executive Officer the rather thankless task of being uh, head of the United Nations Association of the United States, uh, an organization which he served also in a number of other capacities. So may I say personally that Ed Luck has played a fantastically significant role in working with the Secretary General in the preparation of those big reports which have been at the heart of the debate in 2009, 10, 11, and will be again this year. And I'm delighted to be able to invite Ed to talk to you. Ed, to you coming up in the General Assembly. And I think following uh, Navi Pillay and, and Gareth Evans on a platform is certainly uh, uh, not the position one wants to be in. But it is a great pleasure to be here. I just wanted to say a, a word about the Secretary General's approach and philosophy uh, about responsibility to protect, then a word or two uh, adding to Navi's and Gareth's in terms of uh, relationship between R2P and the very important human rights work here in Geneva and around the world. Now there's four dimensions of the Secretary General's approach that I think are worth remembering. Uh, the first is that it builds in a very conscious way on regional and sub-regional initiatives, both normative and operational. Uh, it didn't appear uh, out of nothing. Uh, we continue to recognize the importance of working with regional and sub-regional organizations and arrangements. Uh, the report last year in the debate in the GA uh, was on that subject, and it would be an important part of this next report uh, dealing with uh, response mechanisms. Uh, we also look very much, and the Secretary General has said this many times, to the African roots of the responsibility to protect. Uh, and I think General Agwe will speak to that uh, uh, more directly. Uh, but we recognize it's not only the African experience and African institutions, uh, but in many ways the normative developments within Africa were very important. Uh, to the creation and development of R2P. The second dimension I'd like to mention is the relationship to sovereignty, because I think it's often misunderstood. Uh, the whole point of the responsibility to protect is to strengthen sovereignty, to help states to succeed. Uh, we simply would not accept the notion that somehow it's a part of sovereignty to slaughter one's own own population. That is not part of sovereignty. That's, uh, in fact, undermining the sovereignty of the state. Uh, we assume that states want to protect their populations, and that's one of the reasons, historically, why states were created to begin with. So the responsibility to protect tries to find means to assist states in that task. And we take the second pillar of the Secretary General's strategy on assisting states very seriously. And we note that the very last phrase 
uh, in the outcome document from 2005 from the summit uh, related to R2P uh, talks about uh, assisting states that are under stress. Uh, and we take that very seriously, and I do hope that next year the Secretary General's report and the debate in the General Assembly will focus on that second pillar because we need to find better ways uh, to assist states uh, in helping to build uh, a solid uh, foundation for their sovereignty. The third dimension that has been really central to us comes from the phrase in paragraph 139 of the outcome document that the General Assembly will have continuing consideration uh, for the responsibility of the uh, To us, that's fundamental uh, because it is a normative development, step by step. And we think the first place to start is in the General Assembly because of its universal character. I'm very pleased to see that the Human Rights Council is joining that effort, and I think more work uh, here in Geneva along those same lines can be enormously important. And we do hope that the Security Council will begin to address these issues a little more directly. Uh, it, like the Human Rights Council, has often applied or invoked the responsibility to protect, but we haven't seen the focus kind of discussion uh, that we hope will follow. Uh, as Gareth has said, the fourth dimension really is the dimension both of prevention, <coughs> but also having an early and flexible response uh, when things go badly. Uh, we, are, in this next report, will talk about many, many cases in which responsibility to protect uh, has been uh, implemented through non-coercive measures uh, under Chapter 6 and 8. That's been the heart of the effort. All the focus uh, publicly, of course, has been on those two cases in Cote d'Ivoire and Libya where coercive action uh, under Chapter 7 was decided by the Security Council. But certainly from a secretariat perspective, we see our work day in and day out, and obviously it's in the non-coercive end of the spectrum, and that's in fact the most common way forward. And we recognize as well that we need the flexibility in response because every situation is distinct and needs to be treated on its own merits. And we would say that the assessment and the understanding of what's happening within a given society is really where the responsibility to protect should begin. And that's the most critical element. Now, on the relationship between the work on human rights uh, in the organization and responsibility to protect, it wasn't initially a very easy marriage in some ways. If you're the new kid on the block, uh, it may seem threatening to some, um, and there may be questions raised, but I think what we have found is a very, very good partnership. Uh, I often uh, joke with the High Commissioner that she invokes R2P more often than I do, uh, and that we find the operational elements as well as the normative ones in the human rights mechanisms in the UN to be enormously, enormously helpful uh, as we move forward. Uh, the High Commissioner mentioned the universal uh, peer review. We think that's a very important mechanism as well as, well as peer reviews that we have in, in Africa and some other parts of the world. Uh, we do think commissions of in inquiry can be enormously important. Uh, we see this in Syria. We see this in Libya. Establishing the facts when facts are contested on the ground. As is often said, the first casualty in conflict is the, the truth. And having these kinds of commissions can be enormously important establishing the facts at the time, and then in the longer term, in terms of accountability uh, for those who have committed uh, these kinds of offenses. Uh, and I think we need to remember that R2P deals with a portion of the human rights spectrum, the very most extreme portion, but they are human rights violations. And R2P should be seen as a tool for advancing human rights. And I think people are coming to accept that. R2P offers nothing new in terms of international law. Uh, we don't see it as a breakthrough in that sense. But it offers a way of thinking about how to deal with these uh, crimes. It offers uh, uh, conceptually and strategically uh, ways of thinking about this. And it offers in that sense, I think, ways of going about accomplishing things that have long, long been agreed uh, in the international community. Uh, we do not uh, offer anything new in terms of international law, but we may offer some political emphasis at times that can be helpful. And we very much appreciate the fact that the Human Rights Council uh, has, both in the case of Syria and Libya, uh, acted before the Security Council in terms of voting uh, R2P, and we look forward to working with you uh, in the future uh, on these issues and very much appreciate your being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Be part of this uh, important.
important panel discussion. It's also a pleasure to see all friends here in Geneva. You know, it, it was with some hesitancy that I accepted to be on this panel because uh, it's a sensitive issue that we're addressing. And usually when we talk about R2P, that comes to mind is some kind of intervention, collective actions and use of force. But I, I, R2P is not just about force and measures. It's actually much more about non-force and measures. So today, I'd just like to make a few points. First point is that respons responsibility to protect is the responsibility of all of us. First and foremost, it's the responsibility of states. It's also the responsibility of the international community to assist states in fulfilling their responsibility. But what is important is how we exercise that responsibility in a responsible way. That, that is a point that we, we have to be mindful of. Second point, responsibi responsibility to protect is the core mandate of the Human Rights Council. But from my, in my understanding, in having served as president of the council, it's responsi responsibility to protect with a small r and a small p and one more p. Responsibility to promote and protect. And so that is the mandate of the council. And so it's important that we try as much as possible to effectively discharge the mandate that has been given to us. And if you look at all the measures that are available under R2P, I think the non-coercive measures are the tools and mechanisms that are at the disposal of the Human Rights Council. The point that I'd like to make is that if we get it right, if we do better, if we can maximize and enhance the tools and mechanisms that we have, perhaps we can prevent, perhaps we can preempt, perhaps we can minimize situations that will require more co coercive measures under responsibility to protect. And so we really have to look at the tools that are available to the council, how we can do it better, <coughs> how we can enhance these tools. And I'd like to recall the discussions we had during the review of the council when I was president, because I, I think the discussions we had are uh, very much relevant to the issues <coughs> we're just under responsibility to protect. Now, what are these tools? I think all of you are familiar with these tools, the UPR. Yes, it's about how recommendations are followed up, implemented, but it's also about making the right kinds of recommendations, how to ensure the recommendations are quality recommendations, not politicized recommendations. Second, capacity building. It's very important, but unfortunately, I think a lot of us pay lip service to capacity building. Are we investing the needed resource to help countries develop the capacity to carry out their human rights obligations? Sometimes uh, we have this agenda item on capacity building, but many of us feel it becomes a backdoor for dealing with country situation in a more softer way. But are we really addressing the issue of capacity building? And then, ultimately, it's about how we deal with urgent, emerging situation, country situation. The tools we have right now are uh, the special sessions, the urgent debate, which are very important in addressing these emergency situations. But oftentimes, it, it comes with a sense of stigmatization. Countries are not really engaging early on when a crisis is emerging, or we sense that a crisis is emerging. 
And during the review of the council, we discussed what other formats could we develop to engage countries constructively or to give the sense that countries would want to get engaged with the council when there is a potential crisis looming. We discussed about uh, informal sessions. We discussed about closed door sessions. We talked about voluntary briefings. We talked about presidential statements instead of resolutions, which often uh, countries feel it becomes uh, finger pointing, naming and shaming. We talked about the role of the president, whether the president can play some kind of role to facilitate a consensus in the way we deal with emerging uh, situations. But of course, we could not uh, come to an agreement on these issues, but I think it was useful that we had discussions on how we could develop the tools and mechanisms of the council. And I hope that we can further have discussions on how to enhance the mechanisms of the council. The point that I'd like to make is that once we have to make sure when we talk about RQP that we emphasize the non coercive measures. And once we have exhausted all these non coercive measures, then perhaps there is a basis or some kind of legitimacy to undertake steps that are needed to deal with situations of mass atrocities. And this could involve more coercive measures. But of course, that would be beyond the responsibility of the council. It would be the responsibility of the Security Council to make a judgment on these measures. And these are not easy decisions because whether you have political will, whether you can sustain the political will, whether you have the resources, whether you can apply the coercive measures, including the use of force in an even-handed way, no double standards. And also, intervention also requires responsibility during and after intervention. And this is what Brazil has been discussing, which I think is a very important issue. So um, I, I think it's important for the council to really look at its role with regard to responsibility to protect. It's a core mandate, and it's important for us to really see how we could enhance the tools, the mechanisms, the culture of work, the method of work of the council. Because if we can get it right, if we can do better, I think we will have uh, served the cause of responsibility to protect. Thank you. Thank you, CSI. Really appreciate it. For organizing this side event, I'm honored to, to take part in this panel. The fact that this event takes place in the margins of the Human Rights Council, and at this particular time, when mass atrocities are occurring almost on a daily basis, makes this discussion particularly relevant and timely. This context also adds a sense of urgency and a level of complexity which are impossible to know and which tend to focus the attention perhaps on the more sensitive and divisive aspect of R2P, the possibility of taking coercive measures as the resort to the use of force to stop mass atrocities, which is only, let me remind us, was has been mentioned before, an alternative of exception among many other measures under the umbrella of the third pillar of r That is why I attach great importance to the kickoff of a proper discussion on the first and second pillars of r Not so much because they represent the least constatious aspects of the concept but above all, because they are focused on preventive measures and prevention is the key in this matter. For us, a timely and decisive response, as it goes in the World Summit document, has much more to do with prevention than with reaction. Thus, 
The multilateral system must do everything in its power to avoid reaching the point of reaction. It is critical to gain the largest possible support for RTP. So, any lawful action undertaken in its name can come out with the quietest possible legitimacy. In this regard, I believe that an important avenue that we need to pay is confidence building. Confidence building among member states and in the UN in general, and also taking into account the role of regional organizations. Promoting frank and open discussions is of great value in the search of the broadest common understanding on how states can better fulfill their responsibility to protect their own population. This dialogue could also help to lose the fear that sometimes may exist to refer to this concept when any of the four mass atrocities, crimes, are about to occur or are actually happening. Confidence can also be built through other informal channels, like, for example, networks of focal points that are emerging in different regions and also cross-regionally. In Latin America, a network of focal points for the prevention of genocide has been created a few months ago in Buenos Aires. I consider this could be a first step before adding, hopefully soon, the other three cases of mass atrocities referred to in the 2005 World Summit al Kandaki. In this respect, cross-regional interlinkages are critical. For this reason, Uruguay also participates in the network of R2P focal points initiated by Denmark and Ghana, which Australia and Costa Rica also coordinate. Confidence also needs to be built inside the space. Moreover, in a world where non-state actors are becoming a greater threat for civilian populations who are the direct target of their actions, the assistance to host governments becomes crucial. For that to happen, governments willing to protect their population need to be humble enough to ask for cooperation. The most effective efforts in capacity building are the ones that count with a clear consent, a strong commitment, and a constructive engagement from the host authority, involved in an inclusive dialogue under the principle of national ownership. In capacity building efforts on this matter, international community has many avenues. United Nations has no monopoly. It shares the job with many other actors. The need of joint efforts and coordinated actions is evident, and we should focus on these ways to fulfill it. There are as well a number of tools to assist host governments to prevent mass atrocities, which not necessarily fall under the conceptual umbrella of R2P. We should support these tools and leave in second place how we label them, or in which conceptual category we put it. In the same way, the human rights components of UN field missions have a preventive and capacity building purpose. The Peace Building Commission can also help in these endeavors in countries in the aftermath of conflict or in transitions, to cite a few examples. The Human Rights Council can play a pivotal role in implementing pillars one and two. Its special procedures and mechanisms, as well as the universal periodic review, can work as early warnings due to the information available and at the same time can become a preventive tool by making recommendations in line with the state's responsibility to protect its population and by helping them in implementing these recommendations. Taking into account our tradition, our tradition of respect of international law, 
and being conscious of the sensitivities and the differences that exist around how to implement R2P, I'm convinced that my country and many others in Latin America and the global south can help building the bridges needed on the way, looking for practical solutions based on lessons learned. I come from a region which suffered both mass atrocities by their rulers on one hand and foreign intervention, so not to stop the later, on the other hand. A region which was an early supporter of the peaceful settlement of disputes and a pioneer in the defense and protection of human rights. This put us in a quite favorable position to play a constructive role in, in this process. And I stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. For those of you who the African Union UN hybrid, in Darfur. So a wealth of experience at the sharp end and peacekeeping end of these operations and we look forward very much to hearing what you've got to say. Um, thank you very much on this very important issue, the R2P. Um, it's 10 years now since the Af uh, African Union has actually come up with the Article 4H on the issue of protection and it has generated a lot of controversy. To some, they have seen it just as a norm and not a law. To some, they have seen it as a concept and not yet a policy. But be as it is, one thing is clear, that there are tools in existence now that makes R2P important and uh, implementable. We have issues of early warning, economic sanction, mediation, and a lot of other avenues to address issues that have to do with mass atrocities. And coming from my background and the involvement I've had in peacekeeping, and I have actually served in two missions that have protection of civilians at their mandate, I found R2P to be very apt and important. And I also want to say that uh, African Union have actually shown interest, and a lot of African economic groups have also shown interest well in advance about this issue of R2P. Uh, in West Africa, ECOWAS came out with ECOMOC that even before the Security Council came up with a resolution to assist Liberia, even when the developed world came to West Africa to evacuate their nationals, Afri West Africans found it necessary to do something to make sure that the people are protected. So it has, uh, it, uh, it has been ongoing. And also, the African Union, through its architecture of peace, through the Peace and Security Council, and the panel of wise, and to us in Africa, there is a saying I remember that the words of elders are words of wisdom. So we attach a lot of uh, importance to elders because they come with wisdom and we see this as one of the areas to help uh, prevent and I'm happy to hear all the speakers that have talked about prevention because it is the most important thing that we need especially in Africa where there is a high degree of poverty what I would suggest is that the issue of ownership, we should work together with African government and the organizations itself like the AU and other regional economic body to help them get and acquire the ownership to accept that they are part and parcel of this. Because if we make it look strange, it will make it look punitive, it will make it look as an issue of sanction, 
then you will not get the cooperation you want. And I think as of today, with the highest number of peacekeeping in the world situated in Africa, I think it is important that the world build partnership with Africa to make sure that R2P becomes the cornerstone of all government and original bodies. What I would also suggest is that in helping Africa to have ownership, we should work under the second pillar to help the regional bodies to see how they address these problems. Because after all, the challenges in Africa are nearer to the regional bodies than any other organization. They have uh, a lot of things in common with where the problem is. So it becomes easier if others would help them to identify and resolve the issues. Building capacity is a very important thing. In a place where a lot of people feed below one dollar in a day, you can see where the temptations and everything that would create instability exist. So the other part should help to in help uh, build up the economy of these countries so that they will be able to provide necessary job for the youth. In my country, Nigeria, a lot of you must have heard about the Boko Haram issue. It's really an issue of poverty more than religious intolerance. There are millions of underemployed and unemployed youth. And they said uh, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. So I, I see that working together with the African Union and the regional bodies and African countries, helping them in their security sector reform and judicial reform, <coughs> helping them to build up a strong economy that would act as a stimulant and prevent things that would create the R2P. Finally, let me say that we should avoid giving the impression that R2P is another form of global government or another way of fighting for strategic resources and um, putting our own interests first and not the interests of those involved. Rather, we should dialogue, work together, build confidence, build uh, uh, and build economies and close gaps. And that will reduce, uh, that will create the prevention we need instead of going into the third pillar, which the sad part of it, anytime military intervention comes in, human rights suffer most. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General. Thank you very much for the for the honor of participation in this in this panel and also for your great interest in the, in the entire issue. Uh, briefly, I wish to raise a few points. R2P is essentially about the protection of fundamental human rights, and uh, at least supposedly, when the whole notion was adopted at the World Summit outcome in 2005, it seemed that the protection of fundamental human rights was the clearest. And, let, and the least controversial motif and the uh, component of the entire concept or at least normative foundations and the purposes of R2P, protection of human rights, because after all, the mass atrocities which the implementation of R2P in is intended to avert is practically uh, nothing else than human, human rights emergencies, or more precisely, human rights disasters. Uh, man-made disasters, and uh, once we understand that the, the, the driving motive behind R2P in any aspect of its implementation is certainly about the aversion, the, the prevention of these human rights emergencies, we could place 
the entire notion and the, and the meaning of R2P, the national responsibilities of R2P within the context of human rights obligations. So human rights obligation at least it provides a legal interpretation of what the international community expects from UN member states within their national competences and responsibilities, what they should carry out in order to live up to the commitment made in 2005. And uh, once we understand and accept that uh, responsibility to protect uh, did not create any new obligation or any new uh, restrictions or limitations of member states, rather it just placed in a different uh, dimension the already existing human rights obligations, it could really lead us uh, to, the, to the reason why we should place firmly on the agenda of the Human Rights Council the whole question of R2P and the implementation and, and the national uh, obligations and also the responsibilities of the international community when it comes to situations when R2P is invoked. Uh, R2P can be placed within the existing UN framework of systematic monitoring and situation assessment because if ultimately the entire uh, doctrine is based on the protection of fundamental human rights, the most competent and most authentic uh, UN platform and institutional avenue when this monitoring and assessment could take place is the Human Rights Council. And uh, the Human Rights Council has not only a distinct role in the UN system, but also it has its own, own uh, defined institutional profile and it makes it, it enables, uh, enables, sorry, enables the Human Rights Council to alert and provide system, a systematic uh, overview of the conditions, circumstances or certain tendencies in, uh, in uh, countries or in entire regions which could lead potentially or sometimes very quickly actually to those kind of human rights emergencies which necessitate the invocation of R2P. And uh, the Human Rights Council, by definition of its own sustaining aims as the protection uh, of human rights violations, and what could be more important than the, than the uh, preventive measures or early timely warnings against the most egregious violations of even uh, fundamental human rights. So that's why the Human Rights Council is clearly uh, empowered and I think entrusted by, by the entire, by the membership of the United Nations to deal with all sorts of human rights uh, difficulties, uh, various forms of breaches, and certainly the most, the most uh, intolerable forms of violations, mass atrocities as well. And the, and the Human Rights Council has recently demonstrated, last year and this year as well, how usefully it could call the attention of the UN membership and the member states to various threatening and alarming situations when political conflicts could turn into very quickly and almost almost uh, inevitably without uh, international response to situations which could result in, in mass atrocities. In case of Libya and Syria, the Human Rights Council, I think, already established a very progressive and promising practice when it shows that it's able to provide authentic evaluations and, and reliable, impartial and professional assessment on, through fact-finding uh, missions and reports, and it presents to the central political organs of the U United Nations, which could act and which could play the role as a, as a catalyst for action, for further measures by those, those uh, parts of the UN system which are authorized to take preventive measures at every possible stage of these sort of violent escalations. And it is not the, the, the deficiency or the weakness of the Human Rights Council if this catalytic effect, which is clearly potentially present in the work of the Human Rights Council, if this effect has its own limitations, 
because of course it is not the responsibility of, the, of this council to somehow eliminate the political difficulties or the, or the political obstacles from the UN system, but at least it should certainly provide the necessary and undeniable uh, information and uh, there would be no room for denial or to neglect these alarming situations. And prevention is as essential as we heard as reaction and prevention is certainly uh, the task which the Human Rights Council here to perform uh, most efficiently, at least at the level of information, notification, information and alert. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, Sabo. And questions from Egypt and, and the very important uh, points uh, from our Cuban colleague as well. Um, uh, the question uh, from Egypt about Pillar 2 is a very important one. As I mentioned, I think it's the least developed conceptually and probably even operationally of the three pillars. Um, I don't think, I was speaking to an academic audience uh, last night and, and challenging them uh, that from the academic world, the world of ideas, there hasn't been frankly very much study yet. Uh, for example, of what should UNDP, other development agencies, the World Bank, others, how should they approach uh, assistance from an RTP perspective? Uh, someone mentioned uh, here the, uh, uh, the question of the Peace Building Commission. Uh, again, you know, how to approach those questions in a post-conflict setting uh, to make a reoccurrence of these kinds of, of crimes uh, less likely. I think it's an area that uh, potentially the UN has a lot to bring. Uh, obviously, uh, I've been in conversation with many of my colleagues around the system uh, about this, and they recognize the importance of this. But uh, I think we're at an early stage of really mainstreaming R2P and the overall work of the organization. Uh, but I think it's important on the regional level, and as I say, with the international financial institutions as well. To me, the first step is asking the right questions. In other words, are the development policies pursued by a particular agency or bank or even by a bilateral donor for that matter, are they designed in a way to make atrocity crimes less likely or in fact might they worsen divides within a country and uh, set them up uh, for, uh, for these kinds of crimes. Uh, we have noted it's not always the level of poverty in a country but the enormous differences among different parts of the population. And usually this kind of violence is directed against a minority in the population who rightly or wrongly are perceived as having certain advantages economically, socially, and politically. Uh, so uh, I think your question is an extremely important one. As I say, I hope this would be the subject, though it's not up to me, uh, of next year's report and next year's uh, discussion in the General Assembly. Now that brings me to your very interesting, and I guess, uh, and Gareth's uh, words more theoretical and, and uh, maybe even theological issue on the relationship between the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly. I mean, one, the General Assembly has pronounced on R2P. Uh, it accepted unanimously the outcome document uh, from the 2005 summit. Uh, it also, after our major debate, the largest debate on any issue of the year in the General Assembly in 2009, uh, passed a consensus resolution uh, affirming the need for continuing consideration of this issue. Um, and I don't think there was the intent, if I can read it, uh, into the language to say only the General Assembly uh, should have continuing consideration. I think the implication <coughs> was uh, that the member states as a whole, the intergovernmental bodies within the organization, ought to be considering this. Uh, so I don't, I may be wrong, but I don't, haven't heard really in the debates in the General Assembly the, the cry that, that they and only the Assembly should address these issues. <coughs> this is only a New York issue and only an issue for the Assembly. Uh, it happens that we have in our reports, and this is now going to be the fourth annual report that we've released, uh, the first two were addressed only to the Assembly. And I must say that's something I pushed for myself, saying that because of the normative basis, it was important to bed this in the Assembly and to build on that continuing consideration uh, clause. Uh, but then the one last year, because it was re uh, relating to regional and sub-regional arrangements, uh, which under the Charter is the natural territory for the Council, the Security Council, uh, not the Assembly, we uh, presented to both. And again, this year, uh, I believe the report would be presented to both the Assembly uh, and the Security Council. Uh, but I would think, for example, that there may be things at ECOSOC 
I might want to discuss, uh, particularly concerning the second assistance pillar. So for me, the more discussions we've had, the more member states have been involved, the more candid critiques we've received, received from member states. I think the better our approach has become and the more refined it has become. I have always felt from the beginning that the whole point was to get the member states, as many as possible and as many forums as possible, talking about this and telling us how we can do a better job. So my own approach, and I do think it's the Secretary General's approach as well, would be encourage more discussion and not worry about the more arcane aspects of relationships among various intergovernmental bodies. Uh, to our, our Cuban friend, uh, I appreciate your comments. Uh, they were, as Gareth suggested, stimulating. Um, I very much agree with the notion that you endorse of sovereignty as responsibility. Uh, my colleague Francis Steng, uh, with whom I share a joint office, uh, of course, the Special Advisor in Genocide Prevention, was one of the people who invented uh, sovereignty as responsibility. And I think his interpretation would be rather different than the cast that you gave to it because it has been uh, one of the foundations for creating uh, R2P from the beginning, and we stressed it in the first report uh, from the Secretary General. Uh, second, I completely agree with you uh, that R2P is about the four crimes and their incitement. It's not about other things. And we have been very, very strict about saying it's narrow in terms of the range of crimes to be addressed, but very deep in the number of ways one can go about trying to do something about them. So narrow and deep has been our approach from the very beginning. I completely agree with you on that. Now, a couple of points I somewhat uh, would, would, would dissent. Uh, I don't know which cases uh, where there are hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians killed in the name of R2P. I just don't know what those cases are. Uh, I know which cases uh, we have labeled R2P or, or UN bodies have labeled R2P. Um, and I know very few cases uh, where individual states have tried to expropriate this term. We are concerned about that possibility. Uh, there were a couple cases where this has been done. Uh, one uh, may actually have involved one of the sponsors of your statement. Uh, but we have not suggested that those cases uh, would have involved hundreds of thousands uh, of casualties. I certainly don't see that uh, at all. Uh, second of all, the suggestion that there are no safeguards against abuse. Uh, I think that's absolutely wrong. Uh, we have been very careful, and the Assembly was very careful, and the World Summit was very careful, to embed this within the UN Charter. Most of the critiques of the way R2P has been implemented in some cases have been critiques of an interstate body called the Security Council, set up by the UN Charter. Now, those of us in the Secretariat don't control the, the Security Council or its decisions and we're not here to second guess them. Uh, but the critiques are about decisions by member states under the Charter. Uh, and I think people have to recognize that. If there are cases where those of us in the Secretariat have been very inconsistent or selective or have, have uh, used this in, in inappropriate ways, I certainly would like to hear those. And I always ask member state gatherings, tell us if we are being selective or inappropriate in the way we use it. So far, I haven't had any takers, but uh, you know, I'd be more than welcome. Uh, to, to hear those critiques. Uh, the, the final point uh, on the uh, General Assembly, I, I, I appreciate very much and, and was encouraged by your comment uh, that if the General Assembly were to agree on a framework for carrying out R2P, uh, your group would be among the first to defend the concept in its application. Our view is that the World Summit did that. It laid out quite a careful framework and we have followed it letter by letter, word by word, very, very carefully. Uh, and then that was accepted by the General Assembly, and then, as I say, there was a second resolution uh, by, the, by the General Assembly. Uh, all were, were taken by consensus. Uh, so I think that framework exists. Uh, I think the Secretary General's strategy has simply tried to put it in more operational terms, uh, and I'm afraid uh, Gareth might say more academic terms, in terms of the overall conceptual approach to it. But uh, again, we tried to embed it very, very carefully in that framework, which has been agreed by all member states, uh, no less at the, at the uh, level of heads of state and government. So since that framework exists, I look forward to uh, having you join our ranks in the implementation. I appreciate the, the very uh, uh, useful comments. Thank you. Would any other member of the panel like to comment at this stage or say it up to The work of the council recently has been to, to pay greater attention emergency situations, potential crisis. And unavoidably, when you're dealing with these situations, I think the political considerations come to play. 
And so it's, it's a very politicized process. And so I, I think because of that, you see more politicized in the council. But I think what is important is that the work of the council we should also be concentrating on the promotion and on the more, uh, on the aspects where we can have more cooperation, um, human rights, education, capacity building. So these sort of issues, I think, are also very important to the members of the council. But, but having said that, what I, I noticed after when we deal with the situation in Libya, there, there seems to be a closing of brands in the council on the need to deal with these emergency situations, the importance of the council reacting quickly, otherwise the credibility of the council is at stake. So while I think you know, politics will always be part of the council, because the council comprises member states. Each one have different interests, we have different views of human rights. But at the same time, the fact that I think more and more we're engaging in consultations across regional groupings, such as the efforts here, which brings together countries from various regional groupings, I think we can work towards lessening the politicization and making sure that the council is able to react in a credible way when we need to react. Thank you. Thanks, Isaac. Can I call now on uh, Mr. Pace for the International Coalition? The aspect which I wish to raise uh, in the work of the Human Rights Council that was also the High Commissioner mentioned in the introductory video message that the Human Rights Council could help regional organizations in their own efforts to contribute or to assist the various countries in their own capacity to really preserve human rights and then uh, prevent situations uh, uh, reminiscent of R2P and uh, in this case for example the uh, European Union which is the largest donor combined the EU budget uh, and also member states together which support uh, various countries through development assistance with their focus on human rights uh, capacity reinforcements and I think it would be another very promising aspect of the verse of the, of the work of the Human Rights Council that whenever it, it detects situations or tendencies or circumstances which could be influenced uh, or usefully uh, uh, changed by some other uh, international actor who can be involved, regional organizations, I, th I think this is something which would really uh, support the central role of the Human Rights uh, Council and also help even those other cooperative uh, other bodies, other partners of the UN which are ready to help in this field and I think this would uh, again contribute and, and, and help to place the Human Rights Council in the focus of all these efforts and within the universal system of the UN but also even outside the UN system it could exert certain influence on the activities related to R2P promotion by other international bodies regionally uh, in various parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jim Lecker, to take ownership of what is happening and help them provide the structures that will help the whole thing succeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Luis, Cancela, with a public on the operationalization of this concept. But I haven't heard a single voice saying that the international community must not do its utmost to prevent genocide, war crimes, and cleansing all crimes against humanity. And why? This is, I think, it's because we all share the fact that responsibility to protect at the end of the day is an ethical imperative which reflects a long evolution in the history of humankind. And maybe I'm sounding naive, but I think it's important that we keep in mind this, this consideration. And second and final, R2B is essential for strengthening the multilateral system. We, the ones that believe that 
The multilateral system is the only source of legitimacy and therefore the bedrock of <coughs> rule of law. We know that concerted, consensual multilateral action within the framework and according to the principles and the norms of the UN Charter is the best way to prevent unilateral action and unlawful action. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. See you, sir. Yes, uh, very briefly. I, you know, we're here to discuss the implementation of RTP in the context of, of the Council. I think if we wanted to advance the concept of RTP, we should stay away from having a debate on the concept here in the Council. Because, as the Ambassador Pakistan said, the Council is not the place for conceptual debate. But we do have to see how we can put R2P into action in practical terms in the, concept, in, the, in the context of the Council. So for me, it's simply how can the Council do better in discharging the mandate that has been given to the Council? How we can do better to prevention of early warnings and engaging with countries concerned through dialogue and cooperation to prevent a crisis, a real crisis. Because when it becomes a real crisis, then probably it's beyond the means and capability of the Council to deal with such a situation, which perhaps requires more coercive measures to deal uh, with the situation. So I, I think you know, this discussion on this concept to try to focus on, on the work of the Council and how we can do better in starting the mandate that has been given to the Council. Because these, all these mass atrocities that we discussed about really originates from violation of human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ed Luck? Uh, just very briefly, um, much, much better that care than I am. Um, very briefly, an important comment from Pakistan on double standards. Um, there are two innovations in the Secretary General's approach in, in uh, his first report in 2009 and his strategy that were not in the outcome document, but we felt were a logical extension of it, and the member states seem to agree. Uh, one is that uh, if countries occupy territory, uh, they should have the same obligations in territory that they occupy uh, as in their, their normal territory, uh, and also uh, that uh, non-state actors and armed groups should have the same uh, obligations. We think of groups like the Lords Resistance Army, but there are certainly many others that, that commit these kinds of crimes. Uh, we would not hesitate on the Secretariat side uh, if we thought that any member state uh, was committing crimes or inciting crimes of the magnitude and of the nature covered by those four crimes. And we have not seen it in, in the particular case of, of Israel, uh, but we do uh, watch that situation as we watch other situations. And, and when uh, I was writing the first report for the Secretary General, um, and uh, I happened to, to bump into the Israeli ambassador, I told him that they should expect that the Secretary General was going to include a clause on occupied territories uh, in the document, and, and they happened to say they thought that was, was appropriate. I, I'd just like to apologize to the ambassador, or the representative from Cuba. Uh, probably the length of my response was one of the reasons why you didn't have a chance to get back into the conversation a second time, but. Uh, I would welcome at any point uh, 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 furthering that dialogue, and certainly with your colleagues in New York, as well as colleagues in all the other countries that you mentioned in your group. Uh, we have a very lively and ongoing dialogue, uh, one of which I've learned a great deal, and uh, which I think is a benefit of the concept as a whole. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Shed, and thank you very much, Phil. It's a, a conceptual debate. Let's recognize the reality but the Human Rights Council has a very important value-adding role to play in the practical implementation at the preventive stage of this concept. And let's just focus in a very hard-headed way on that. I think for those of you who are minded to continue the conceptual debate, like our colleagues from uh, Cuba and Pakistan, can I just say this, that um, responsibility to protect is not the old humanitarian intervention wine <coughs> dressed up in some new bottle. The right to humanitarian intervention is dead. Nobody anywhere is arguing and advocating for such a right to exist, quote unquote, in the way that was widely argued in the 90s. 
and in a way which was incredibly divisive in the international community. Nobody is arguing that anymore. What is being argued for is a much more nuanced concept of the responsibility to protect, which does acknowledge there may be in extreme and exceptional cases when under the authority of the Security Council, properly exercised, and that's the ground for debate, where such use of force is justified. But overwhelmingly, the emphasis of the new doctrine is on prevention in all its dimensions and is on ways of dealing with these situations short of those most extreme uh, kinds of force which are authorised by the Council. So please, please, please accept the reality that that debate has moved on. And accept the reality, please, that what we have to do as an international community is really recognise that we are all in this together. We have been shamed as a collective international community by our inattention to these issues in the past, our indifference in the past, our inability to agree on decisive and effective action, our inability even to come to terms with the need to condemn such action. Don't let us be shamed again. Too often in the past we've had to say, well, never again, never again, never again, and to repeat with a kind of a mixture of anger and incomprehension and shame that we've been put in a position of yet again saying, never again. Let's recognise that we have moved past that, we have a foundation, we have some common ground at last on which we can come together as an international community. Of course we are going to have continuing disagreements about what precisely this concept demands in particular situations, particularly at the hard end, the sharp end, when prevention has failed and we're confronted with an ongoing explosive situation. These are tough, tough issues. And they do involve hard, difficult politics. But don't let that get in the way of the recognition that this is an issue where, frankly, our common humanity is at stake. Where there is, as so we said, an ethical imperative for us to prevent and for us to act. And I hope we can at least go away from this uh, session, this very admirable and uh, very effective session, very practical session, identifying specific measures. I hope we can go away with that common perspective and work together to resolve such remaining areas of difference as there are between us. I thank you all, thank uh, the panellists, and uh, thank the sponsors of this particular event. Thank you.